Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have yet another bear thesis. This time it's real estate. Isn't it interesting how there's always an upcoming real estate crash all the time? This time it's the commercial real estate sector. So there's a commercial real estate sector that's going to crash in the US. And even CNBC has jumped onto these headlines with detailed articles of why the commercial real estate industry in the US is in trouble. Now we're gonna be looking over their claims and seeing how realistic this is and how concerned you should be. But I also wanna do something interesting in this episode, which is I wanna look at all these type of bear claims, the bears versus reality. And I have a list of what I've compiled of different things just like this. So we're gonna look back over the past couple of years and see how this tallies up, if the bears are winning or if the bears are losing. Now we have some other big news. Super Mario Brothers is just knocking it out of the park with this new movie, the new Super Mario Bros movie. This has had a record smashing box office open for the opening weekend for an animated movie, which even has beat out Disney. So the question arrives, is this company going to build out an enormous moat and an ecosystem of monetization? And what does this mean for the company's future overall? And how does this impact Disney as well? We're gonna be looking at this new Nintendo movie and what this means for the future of Nintendo, for the future of Disney, and the future of the box office. And then finally, we have the Costco for Millennials, otherwise known as Boxed.com, going bankrupt. That's right. Just a couple years ago, this was hyped up as being one of the big competitors to Costco. There was articles like this from insiders saying, we compared Costco for millennials with the real Costco, and one had the clear advantage over the other. So this is an interesting comparison of this newer company, Box.com, against Costco itself. Well, unfortunately for Box.com and its shareholders, if you visit the website right now, it has an announcement regrettably informing you that Box.com is no longer operational. The company has declared bankruptcy. We're also gonna be doing a little bit of a post-mortem, looking at old interviews of the founder and CEO of Box.com, what his thought process was, how he was directing the company, and where things went wrong. Why this company ended up failing to compete with Costco. So we have all of that to get to, plus much more on this episode of The Joseph Carlson Show. Let's go ahead and jump right in. This time we'll start off with the headline news, which is the upcoming commercial real estate crash. And I wanna to go to a video and an interview just this morning of someone on CNBC that describes this problem very succinctly. This is the RXR Realty CEO. Yeah, well, I mean, I think let's just start with after decades of free money, the day of reckoning is coming as we're seeing with the financial meltdown across the board. There's $1.5 trillion of commercial real estate loans that are coming due in the next three years. Mm -hmm. um, and these loans were made at periods of time where their interest rates were you know, near zero. So you know, to refinance them today, they're gonna to be at much higher interest rates, much lower values, and now at a, in one of the unprecedented, illiquid marketplace, right? So this is a, a major challenge for, to, be, uh, to go through the process, and so. Now that's basically the entire problem summarized there in just a couple of sentences. Over the next three years, we have $1.5 trillion of debt that has to be refinanced in commercial real estate. And the refinancing of that debt is likely to happen at a much higher interest rate, which makes it difficult for these companies to refinance and pay the debt based on their income currently. Now, the first thing I'll mention is this is generally speaking why I avoid companies that have a lot of debt. I've trimmed down my portfolio to companies that really don't take out a lot of debt. In fact, in my entire portfolio, I have one indebted company one company in the real estate category. That company's Vici. Vici does operate with a decent amount of debt. Vici could technically be considered commercial real estate, but it is very distinct from the type of companies they're talking about here. Vici Properties is gaming and casinos and resorts and experiential properties, mostly concentrated in Vegas. So that's a very unique version of commercial real estate. But having said that, Vici is a company that operates by taking out debt, and they do that at the lowest interest rate possible. Now, odds are the company will be fine. Their debt's heavily staggered far out in the future. Most of their interest payment refinances happen in 2027 and beyond. So they have a lot of time for interest rates to go lower. But if interest rates continue to hike upwards, it would lower the profitability of Vici in the future if they had a refinance at a much higher price. Outside of Vici, I hold no other company that deals with significant amount of debt. So in my portfolio and aggregate, I've avoided most of these concerns. Now on this subject, I wanna point out a phenomenon that's been happening for a long period of time, but I think it's especially bad right now. That is a phenomenon of social media, YouTube, and even the news focusing heavily 
on negative upcoming dramatic predictions. We've seen this on YouTube. For example, I can throw up some thumbnails of random YouTubers here. These are some smaller ones. We have this one right here. He's looking really, really concerned because there's a housing problem. We have another one here. He looks outright shocked. Shocking build report centered around real estate. And these are all within just the past couple of months. We have another one. He looks very shocked. These are all different people because homes are, are the real estate market's drying up this time. We have another one here. House price being cut. We have a little Zillow cut out there down $210,000. And these are all random smaller YouTubers. But then we can move on to the biggest YouTubers. We can pick on the biggest YouTuber in the financial space for a minute, which is Graham Stephan. He gets the most views, he generates the most clicks, he has the most buzz with his channel. We can look at some of the thumbnails from just the past couple of months. This is from the past three months. We have this one right here. Zillow, price cut, $535,000. The title of the video says to not buy real estate in 2023, you're going to regret it. And he looks very concerned. We have another one here and it, it just goes on and on. These are all from just the past couple of months. But you can clearly see the theme of the thumbnails here. Houses are literally on fire. They're in flames in the background. If that's not attention grabbing, I don't know what it is. The reason that this happens in media is not because of accident. You can look at the YouTube analytics and every single time videos that have scary backgrounds that have glaring concerns, they get more clicks, more attention, they generate more ad revenue and they get more subscribers than their counterparts that are more tamed or more nuanced. Human beings have a tendency to focus on threats to them than they do anything else. So even though there might be only one piece of negative news amongst a lot of positive news, as humans, we ignore most of that positive news and we focus in on that one piece of negative news. That one threat to our existence is what our brain says, you must focus on that threat. Block everything else out and focus on the threat because if you don't, that threat may get you. In most cases, these type of doom and gloom predictions do not come to fruition. And we can look at the recent evidence of this. Let's go over here to what I call the bears verse reality. This is a list that I compiled of just recent events of where we have bearish predictions, lots of clickbait, lots of doom and gloom from different people, and then we have the reality of the situation. And we'll look at the tally here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first one. A year and a half ago, we had the bears on inflation. If you'll recall, there was many people, many bears saying that inflation was going to be out of control, that the Fed had no control over inflation. The Fed couldn't even raise interest rates because if they did, we couldn't pay on the national debt and everything would spiral out of control. Spiraling out of control is what's called hyperinflation, where inflation goes from 9% to 12%, to 14%, to 17%, and then it's in the upper teens percentage. That's what a lot of bears were predicting just a year and a half ago. What's happened over that time period? The reality is inflation has gone down. You no longer hear these predictions. The Fed did raise interest rates even with the national debt. They have slowed down inflation. Every single month, inflation is taking another leg down. It's had around seven months of consecutive decline in inflation. There's now predictions that in the next year, inflation will be around 3%, very close to their target 2%. And we're not hearing so many predictions about the hyperinflation from the bears anymore. Those claims of hyperinflation have come and gone. We have the next claim from the bears. The stock market will collapse after the recent rebound. This is another big prediction. To sell the rally, there's going to be a massive collapse. This is one that Michael Burry, even himself, tweeted out just one word, sell. He tweeted out to sell. Now, he could have listened to his advice, but that would have been the wrong move. Even Michael Burry himself later said, quote, I was wrong to sell. In another tweet, he admitted fault, saying to sell, even though the dip was bought, stock prices went higher. The next claim from the bears, the banking collapse because of Silicon Valley Bank will be systemic. It's gonna spread through the economy. It's gonna have unknown consequences. The entire US financial system is going to collapse. There was bears that were using this as an example of the next big problem of why investors should be concerned. The reality, the banking collapse looks to be mostly resolved. Jamie Dimon even came out saying that this is no 2009, that there's gonna be some minor consequences, but overall it looks like things are wrapping up and it looks like in a couple of weeks, this will be mostly over. 
No systemic risk. No problem for investors. Once again, the bears and their cataclysmic predictions were proven wrong. Now moving down the list, we have the next one here. The bears say that we're going into a terrible recession. That was many of the predictions just a few months ago, but with the latest economic news, now there's lots of people changing their tone on that as well, saying that the recession doesn't look quite as terrible as it used to look. There's many of them saying that we may avoid a recession overall. Mohammed El Aaron just went on to CNBC today and said that we could actually avoid a recession. So yet another prediction of calamity, doom and gloom that's not coming to fruition from the bears. And then finally, we have the most recent example here, the commercial real estate will collapse. The $1.5 trillion in refinancing over the next three years is going to cause the entire segment to collapse. The reality of this one is unknown. So overall, when we look at what the bears say versus the reality of the situation, I see a couple patterns emerge. First of all, we see repeatedly that the bears predictions are largely wrong. They're almost always wrong. They're repeatedly, continually, over time proven wrong. There's only a couple examples of where bears got the predictions right. And those examples are so rare, so unique, that there's movies made about them. The Big Short was a movie made about where a couple people predicted calamity of epic proportion and they actually got the prediction correct. In reality, for the past decade plus, the bears have repeatedly been wrong. They've been predicting doom and gloom, calamity, and in every case, proven to be overly dramatic and overly sensational. The sensationalization of this type of news, having pictures of flaming homes in backgrounds of videos, that is sensationalism. That drives a lot of attention, a lot of interest to a video. It helps get people's eyes attracted to your content. But in reality, these type of predictions are wrong, continually wrong. The next thing I'd say that I notice is that the bears really never mention when they get it wrong. There's only one instance I can think of, which is when Michael Burry said that he was wrong to say sell. That was one of the rare occasions where he admitted that he got a bearish prediction false. In almost every other case, the bears make wrong predictions of doom and gloom and calamity. When those predictions don't happen, they just move on to the next prediction. The next one. It doesn't matter that the last one they got was incorrect. They move on to the next one. And eventually, they might get something semi-correct, and that will be all they talk about for the next 10 years, is the one time that they got a prediction somewhat correct. All the dozens and dozens of predictions that they got incorrect over the past 10 years, they will completely ignore. And then finally, the next takeaway from this for me is that there's always something to be worried about. Peter Lynch famously said that in the 1970s that during his entire career, there was always, always something for you to be concerned about as an investor. And you have to live with that. If you're new to the stock market, just realize that when you're making your investments in the companies, there's no seemingly perfect investment that doesn't have something potentially wrong with it, that doesn't have some type of threat. There's always going to be something to worry about. And while all of these concerns have existed for the past 30 years, since Peter Lynch was investing in the 1970s, the market has gone up over and over and over again. So over time, quality companies overcome these type of problems. But overall, I wanted to highlight this because we see more news like this all the time. It just becomes a little nauseating to see more doom and gloom predictions almost every single day. And I think it's important for investors to see the history to see that the bears are almost always incorrect, to see that they sensationalize the news continually, and to know that if you continue to invest in the stock market, you're gonna deal with this all the time. So maybe the commercial real estate market really will collapse, maybe it won't. In my opinion, I think it's very unlikely and I think investors are gonna spend far too much time concerning themselves with it. Now moving on, we have Nintendo saying to Disney, step aside, there's a new sheriff in town. We have Nintendo's new animated film smashing records in the box office. They say that it crushed the competition with its jaw-dropping 204.6 million domestic and 377 million global debut over the long Easter weekend. 377 million globally on Easter weekend. And I don't even believe that it's open in Japan quite yet. So this has a long runway. I think right now it's easily going to get over 500 million. It even might get up to 600, 700 million. So we'll see if this tapers out, but I think this still has a long ways to go. Now they say that the results far exceeded the expectations and even surpassed the starts of the recent installments in Universal's biggest franchises, like Jurassic World Dominion, which did 145 million opening domestically, and Fast and Furious 9, which did 70 million. So speeding out some older franchises, both Jurassic World and Fast and Furious, 
have had a lot of movies. We're on number nine for Fast and Furious. But Nintendo so far has done 377 million and the cost of making it was 100 million. So this is a huge, huge profit generator for Nintendo and Illumination. And they're going to make more of these movies. And that leads to the question of what does this mean for Nintendo's future? What I've seen is a lot of investors make big predictions off of this movie. They're saying that Nintendo has this new massive revenue stream, that they're the new Disney, that they can build out an ecosystem of their gaming system, which Disney has not been successful in getting into gaming. Nintendo has that, and they can make the video games and their movies have a great ecosystem with each other. That is true. This is gonna open up a big new revenue stream for Nintendo, but I think what investors are missing in these extrapolations is a difficulty of trying to keep these franchises alive in the box office. For example, we have Star Wars, possibly one of the biggest franchises in the box office ever, maybe next to Marvel. Disney's making another three Star Wars films, and the initial reception is great, more Star Wars films. Are they going to be better than the ones recently? Are they going to have a new fresh take? It doesn't look like it because they're even bringing back the older stars, Daisy Ridley as a role in Ray. So a lot of people are looking at this without as much enthusiasm as they had initially. There's many articles about superhero fatigue when it comes to the Marvel universe. Lots of Marvel movies have come out over the past couple of years. This phase of Marvel seems to have far less enthusiasm associated with it than the initial phase, than phase one, because people have seen so much Marvel. Every Marvel movie has been made, and it seems like they're running thinner on ideas. They're having to rehash a lot of material. After the movie Thor Love and Thunder received very poor reviews for being over the top with its comedy, not taking anything serious, even Chris Hemsworth, one of their big Marvel actors, said that he's only going to return to the role of Thor if there's, quote, a drastically different take on the character. He wants something different if he's actually going to redo it because he's basically saying we've done everything in Marvel over and over again and now it's just purely money grabs. There's nothing original or new about what we're doing here. On Disney Plus, we're seeing a big decline in streaming numbers for the new season of Mandalorian. When this first came out, people could not get enough of Mandalorian. The service, Disney Plus, had 10 million signups for the service on day one. There's so many people trying to stream it all at once that they literally crashed the service, Disney Plus. But here we are, season three, a fresh new season, and the headlines are that The Mandalorian sees a huge drop in viewership for the season three premiere. They say while Disney does not reveal their specific viewership numbers, Samba TV's a third party data analysis said that The Mandalorian's third season debut was watched by just under 1.5 million households in the US. This compares to 2.08 million who tuned in to the season two premiere or 2.14 million that watched Ewan McGregor's The Return of Obi-Wan Kenobi. What makes this all the more disappointing is that the trailer for season three became the most watched trailer for any Star Wars Disney Plus series ever. So people saw the trailer. They, they were aware that the season was happening, that was starting, and the viewership has dropped off from 2.08 million last year to 1.5 million this year. These are the challenges that Disney currently faces, a catalog of franchise content that's high quality, but that's largely been exhausted over the past couple of years. Every movie that you can think of made about these type of franchises has been made over and over again, to the point where viewers are starting to push back and saying that we're not gonna be watching these with the same enthusiasm we had originally. And that is a problem that Disney's currently facing that they're really working to address. They're trying to change the cadence and quality and direction of a lot of films because they feel like the last season of their content for both Marvel and Star Wars was subpar. When viewers are offered an alternative, something new, something original, something that they haven't seen a million times over and over again for the past five years, they flock to it. And this time it was Super Mario Bros. Was Super Mario Bros. the best piece of content made over the past five years? The movie received high reviews, but it's not the best movie ever made. What made this movie really good is that it was unique. There was a novelty behind it. It was the first one ever made. So viewers were naturally interested in it. But I believe that Nintendo is going to face the very same problem as Disney. They're gonna come out with more and more content trying to monetize this new revenue stream. They'll come out with a sequel, a Yoshi-centered one. They'll come out with a Luigi's Mansion one. They'll come out with one centered around Bowser and different side quests. And they will do well, but over time, the same impact will happen from viewers as they create more and more content centered around the same group of characters and they reuse themes over and over again, 
viewership becomes less and less drawn to it. And unless they can keep it entirely original and different in every single movie, which has proven to be incredibly difficult, there's going to be diminishing returns going forward. This time it had the novelty effect. It was new, it was different, and that led to wild success, but they lose the novelty effect next time. And after that, it becomes even less novel and even less novel. So overall, I am excited and happy about Nintendo's success. I think it's good to have original content in the box office. But for investors, I would temper your expectations about the future with Nintendo. I think that they'll likely run into the very same challenges that Disney had with using content repeatedly centered around the same IP. It's a very difficult business to be in. Now, moving on, we have news about the new Costco for millennials and how this whole thing turned out. Costco for Millennials, which is Box.com, a company that just last week announced bankruptcy. What I want to do is a bit of a post-mortem here. I want to compare it to what Costco actually does, because as you may know, I am a big investor in Costco. I have the consumer category here. Costco is one of my larger holdings. It's one of the nine core holdings. I consider it to be a high quality compounder. I think that it will outperform the general market over the next 10 years, despite its seemingly high price and high PE ratio. Right now, the company in my portfolio is a $41,500 holding, and I'm in the green by $5,700. And I have recently purchased more of this company as it's it's gone a little flat for a while. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of the supposed threats to Costco. It was a company called Box.com, which the subline of it, the heading of it was basically Costco for millennials. It was Costco, but online and in a more modern way. This is an article from Insider in 2018. So this is when Box was really getting going, when it was getting a lot of attention. Unlike Costco, Box is digitally native. It has mobile ordering and one to three day delivery. It also offers free two day shipping if you spend more than $49 and it doesn't require a membership to make a purchase. That sounds pretty good. Free delivery, two to three day delivery. You can buy anything digitally native. It sounds sleeker and younger than Costco, better. It almost sounds too good to be true. Let's go ahead and continue reading on. Costco has an online store in addition to its physical warehouses, but products across all categories tend to cost more online than stores. Though the website allows shoppers to order from Costco without paying for a $60 annual membership, a $5 surcharge is applied at checkout. However, Costco has been taking some steps to reach more millennial shoppers, like offering two-day delivery through Costco Grocery and one-day delivery through a partnership with Instacart. Now that's an important point. Costco does have an online presence. It's Costco.com. And a couple years ago, I was asked about this company, Box.com. One of the people on my Discord said, does any of you guys use Boxed? He said, it's the online Costco. I replied to that and said, Costco.com is the online Costco. And that right there can be a red flag in and of itself. When people invest in companies saying, this is the Amazon of this, or this is the Microsoft of this, or this is the Costco of this. There is only one Amazon, there's only one Microsoft, and there's only one Costco. And these little imitators, like Box.com, are not going to replace these companies. Now, continuing on with this comparison, they say that both websites offer major savings for bulk shoppers, but upon trying both, I found one was way easier to use than the other. See what it's like to shop at each. This insider review goes on about how Costco.com is way more difficult to shop on than Box.com. Costco is the first site I went to. On the homepage, there were members only saving deals, buyers picks, and a selection of different featured products in a variety of categories. It was hugely different from the Boxed homepage, which was very simple and sleek. So Boxed had a nicer website. It was simpler and sleeker to use. Costco had far more departments on its website, but it was cluttered and hard to navigate compared to Box. Boxed had a cleaner look. Though there weren't as many categories, it was easy to find everything because the existing categories were pretty broad. So even though Box didn't have as much stuff to sell, at least their navigation was a little bit more cleaner and sleeker looking. In this review, comparing these two companies goes on and on and on, giving a glowing review to Box.com, how the website's better, how the navigation is better, how, how everything about it is superior to Costco. And in culmination, they say overall, the Box website was much easier to use than the Costco website. Even though the Costco website offered the same treasure hunt experience that its stores do, it was difficult to browse for products and the deals weren't as good as in stores. Boxed also made it easier to get perks like free shipping 
and 2% cash back. So Boxed is the superior website. But now when you go to Boxed, superior, sleeker website that's easier to navigate, you get an announcement that they're going bankrupt and they're shutting down all of their retail operations. So what went wrong here? Let's go ahead and take a look. So first of all, let's look at the CEO back in 2017, talk about what the major focus of the company was. After that, and after things started to pick up, I know you grew very rapidly. Can you give me an example of how rapidly? Yeah, so I guess that the craziest um, after that initial period, I mean, we were doubling every 90 days. Every 90 days, every we were 90 doubling. days, we were doubling wow. the business. And like, so, so this is like an exponential. Oh yeah, wow. I mean, it, it really was just unreal. Like, uh, and so you'll see a lot of folks uh, look back fondly at that time as as something that really galvanized our culture and and kind of our our way of, uh, of business. He said that the company was doubling in revenue every 90 days, doubling in revenue. But there's no attention paid or no comments about the actual profitability of the company. And this is something that you'll notice repeatedly throughout this interview if you watch the entire thing. There's commentary and talk about the revenue growth, the growth of the company, but no commentary, no talk about the profitability because there was no profitability. They were growing revenue in an unscalable way, losing more and more profits the more they grew revenue. I went and scrolled down to the comments of these videos to see if there's anybody else that noticed this. And here's a comment that was left four years ago from Lee Churchill, who was spot on about this. He says, always talk of revenue, but what about profitability? I have doubts about a company with that kind of overhead being sustainable. Amazon diversified well and can handle the money pit, but Box will likely run out of capital at some point and go the way of Webvan or Cosmo. Further, treating low value bulk items like toilet paper and bottled water as special delivery parcels is intrinsically wasteful. The air inside the package pillows with the boxes is factored into the dimensional weight of the parcel. Lee is correct here. He says that the CEO was focusing just on the revenue, not on the profitability, and there's some problems fundamentally with the business model. That is precisely why Costco likes you to go into the warehouse to buy those things than trying to ship them out themselves. They are very difficult to ship out at a profit. And then there was other commenters with more upvotes that replied to this person saying, why would it matter if they profit? They grew within three to four years from a garage to over a nine figure, four large warehouses and are making a difference in employees' lives. Everyone wants the profit details. Who cares as long as you're making money to support the business more and helping your employees? This person says who cares about the profit non-ironically. As long as you're helping out the employees, who cares if the company's profitable? And keep in mind that he has more people thumbs upping his comment supporting it than the person that is concerned about the profitability of the company. Well, CJW Graphics may be may be saddened to learn that if a company can't sustain a profit, the company will not exist. And the employees that once were being helped will be fired, they'll be laid off. Now all the employees in their retail portion of their business don't have a job anymore. So overall, it's not helpful to the employees if the company can't run a sustainable, profitable business. And this is another point that they talk about in the interview, how much they're doing for the employees. Um, but on top of that, we also pay for uh, the subsidization of life-changing events. So like, when, you know, if you get married or oh. if, uh, for weddings or if you... Um, you pay for part of their wedding. For part of their weddings or... Uh, Box was gracious enough with the investor-fused money because they weren't making any profits at the time, but they were gracious enough to take investors' money and pay for part of employees' weddings. Any life-changing event, they help cover the cost because they want to be such a good employer. Unfortunately, again, it's tough to be a great employer when you can't run a profitable business. Now, Box stock has been delisted from the New York Stock Exchange, but luckily we can look at the old financials in Qualtrum because they still currently exist in the database. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the financials looked like historically. We can first go to the revenue of the company. In 2021, when it was finally a SPAC deal, a publicly listed company, it did 40.86 million in revenue. The revenue grew for only three quarters and then the revenue started to actually go down. Didn't have a deceleration, it went down in total terms. Since September of 2021, the revenue went down four consecutive quarters. Not what you wanna see with a company that is not only unprofitable, but it's relying on rapid scaling and revenue growth to get to profitability. The EBITDA for this company has never been positive in its entire history. The free cash flow, this is the big one. How much money is a company making or losing after all of their CapEx expenditures? 
This shows the true profitability of the company based on its in and out cash flows. We can see that every single quarter, once again, the company posted negative free cash flows. Now, some quarters were bigger losses than others, but sustaining continual losses in free cash flow is very difficult for a company. You have to prove to investors you're going to become profitable very quickly because if investors pull their funding, your company cannot sustain itself. This is the lifeline of cash a company needs. When we factor in dilution, not only was a company losing free cash flow, but they're also paying themselves in stock-based comp, paying for all those weddings and all the various expenses that comes with hiring those employees. The net income shows the same picture. The earnings per share, of course, have been negative overall. You can't have earnings per share that are positive when the company's losing money in EBITDA, free cash flow, and net income. At the same time, the balance sheet got dramatically worse since 2021. Not only was a company increasing the amount of debt, but you can see their cash burn. This doesn't look pretty. If you're the CFO of the company, you're panicking here. You are panicking to the rest of the executives, saying that we're running out of money every single day. Every day their cash balance is going down, cash is going down, cash is going down, while the debt is increasing. The amount of leases they have and obligations is increasing. Not a fun situation to be in. I think what you can learn here is that as much research as you do on the glowing reviews a company may get for a specific product, all the hype behind it, all the little labels and cliches, the Costco for millennials, how the company had a better website than Costco.com, and even looking at the CEOs and founders themselves describe the company and how well they're treating employees and how good they're doing everything, it doesn't compensate for the fundamentals of the company. At the end of the day, the fundamentals are really what drive the intrinsic value of a business. Not the flattering talk from the CEO laying out his vision, not the raving reviews online about how it's better or sleeker than Costco, it's the fundamentals of the business. And unlike Box.com, Costco has reached massive scale. They have over 60 million subscribers. They are highly profitable through all economic environments. And that's something very, very difficult to replicate. And a little startup company that wants to be the millennial version of Costco is not going to cut it. So as I said two years ago, Costco.com is the online Costco. And as for Box.com, they join the large graveyard of companies that have tried to compete with Costco. That's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.